Welcome to Career in Ruins, where at some point we'll stop fishing in the time team well, but not just yet. Derek, that's 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 a promise we can't uphold, surely. <laughs> I know, right? Some of the most interesting people we know now are from Time Team. How are, are we, we getting lazy? Are we getting no? We're not getting lazy. We just got a, a rich seam of fantastic people we can tap into. And it also seems to bring more listens. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's too cynical. How are you, mate? How are you? <laughs> I'm very well. I'm very well. It's an exciting week this week. Yeah, we've got, we've got two brilliant days ahead of us, haven't we? We have. Yeah, we have, haven't we? We've got. Well, we've got a really interesting talk, a retirement talk from. One Paul Cheatham at mm-hmm. Bournemouth University, geophysics extraordinaire. I'd say world famous geophysicist in his own mind. Um, he's yeah, he's having a go away, going away party tomorrow. I just picked up 20 litres, no, 20 pints of Big Dig beer from the Big Dig Brewery. Shout out to you guys. Thanks for supporting Time Team as well. Um, and we're going to have some free beer and free wine, listen to a talk and then hang out a bit, aren't we? That'd be nice. And then it's Bournemouth University's graduation day, which it, I, get sit on the, I get to sit on the, the um, stage and look vaguely important in my, in my phd robes for the first ever time that's very exciting you get to wear your new hat <laughs> yeah hopefully it's like a pumpkin <laughs> I, i'm excited to recreate the photo from last time we gate crashed gad graduation and enjoyed ourselves a bit haven't, too much haven't you got a really important role in this as well i have to stand on the stage and pass a list of names from one person to the other <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure you, you, you. There's no way of messing that up. Yeah, there's no. <laughs> don't get in your own head, Derek. There's just, no way you can get it wrong. There's just enough to do to keep me awake, but not quite enough that I can make a mess of anything. It's, uh, it's that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> yeah, there's always, there's always time. There's always time. <laughs> no, that's going to be really nice. And I, I guess Paul and John Gator must have been good pals in the the good old Bradford days, back when they had free colour being invented. I think it was I, back in the black and white days. I yeah. mean, ah. Uh, are geophysicists are, are they chums are they pals or are they all just arch rivals <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question uh, maybe we should do a career in ruins with paul and uh, and ask him that question a, a uh, retirement special how's your week been been since we caught up last it's been good it's been good to get back into back into the swing of things lots of fun stuff at work going on i still haven't got any more plastic ducks this week but no. so but the, Clearly the podcast person that's doing update. it doesn't listen to career in ruins <laughs> i know gutted um <laughs> Uh, I've got, got a team of folks doing some nice digitising on some of your stuff, which is yeah. exciting. Yeah. Um, how are you recovering from it all? Oh, uh, do you know what? It's it's so for those, I don't know if we, we didn't go into too much detail in it last week's podcast, but we, we spent a week digging in Sherwood Pines in Not- Nottinghamshire um, on a First World War training training area. And um, during, my, I realised my, my week's the length the, w- the length of time that the week went on and my stress levels just were incremental um but i i finally recovered and it was absolutely brilliant it was such a good excavation such a great team really interesting history and archaeology and um yeah i'm looking forward to getting the report done understanding the artifacts a bit more and and sharing it with people in a uh, forthcoming manner <laughs> uh-huh is that something you can tease a little bit more about if i keep an eye on time team news this yeah, weekend yeah check out time team news this weekend and, and you, you might be you might get an insight into what we were up to i can't wait looking forward to it but never mind what we've been up to we should yeah. get on with the podcast also, never mind time team this is career in ruins and yeah what, what yeah. career in ruins are we learning about this week derek well today we are joined by the wonderful Helen Geek, who is a small fine specialist, Anglo-Saxon expert, Green Party activist, and according to X, formerly known as Twitter at least, is a self-described time team old git. (laughs) Thank you for joining us, Helen. It's a great honour and a privilege to be here. And time team old git wasn't my coinage. I think that was one Mr. Tim Taylor who said, (laughs) calling you all this, it's not supposed to be rude. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a term of affection, right? 
Kind of, yes. I am the youngest of the old git, so I would I would steadfastly remind everybody of that. <laughs> How have you been, Helen? I don't think it's been a couple of months since we saw you last, and that was somewhere around Dorset, but have you been keeping well? I have. Actually, yesterday I had a really exciting time because I went up to Kings Lynn to see the Guildhall, um, which is having a, a, a huge refurbishment. And we filmed a little snippet of that for Time Team News. Um, but there was so much there. We could only cover a tiny, weeny little bit of it. And, and it felt more like a recce than than going and filming a bit of news. So I really, really, really want to go and do some more work, something bigger at Kings Lynn, which is just an amazing place. Have either of you ever been there? No, no, not been there. Stunning. I mean, it's just like a, a stage set everywhere you go. Uh, there's the, you you could film almost any film you wanted to in Kings Lynn, from a dystopian 1960s thing to um, to Dickensian London. Oh, that sounds great. I'll have to tune into Time Team News to uh, to find <laughs> out more. But uh, enough about Time Team. Enough about Time Team, or at least for now. Helen, <laughs> welcome <laughs> to Korean Ruins. And what what we're really excited to hear about today is your career in ruins and we've got a series of questions we like to ask but we always kick off the interviews with asking the participant the interviewee to tell us about their career in ruins where you started from where your passions grew from and sort of your your trajectory your movements in within different jobs well yes that's a good question because i'm not one of these people who has always known what they wanted to do for a living I I I didn't really want well, I never wanted to work hard. I'm afraid I'm the kind of person who like the drummer in Spinal Tap, is it? Or is it the keyboard one that player? Uh, no, it's the drummer who always gets blown up, isn't it? So it must be the keyboard player who says, I just want to have a good time all the time. <laughs> so that was me. I wanted to have a good time. Um and I uh, so I had no ambition at all. Uh, I was written off by my school because I didn't want to go to university um and so I left school with nothing to do and I drifted about aimlessly and went to sign on um I mean you know this isn't the way most careers start is it go down to the DHSS just like um everybody else in the 1980s and they sent me to the careers office because I was only 17 um and they said you can't do nothing you have to do something so they sent me to the careers office and the careers office gave me a list of jobs I could do. They, they were training courses, youth training schemes, it was called. So uh, I looked at hairdressing and I thought, well, I'm just not artistic enough. And I, I was quite tempted by tree climbing. Apparently that's the best thing to do for their life. Is that a job? It's, well, it's a tree surgeon, really, but oh, they, yeah. they sell it to the 17 year olds by calling it tree climbing. <laughs> there was dry stone walling and there was welding. But I had, I was an aficionado of the women's magazines, even in those days. And they said, essentially, if you can type, someone will always employ you. And I thought, well, it's, you know, that uh, that's a transferable skill. I'll get that. So I went off to Secretarial College, uh, where I learned to type off Demon. Um, and I got a placement as an architect. They, they would have normally employed a, a proper grown-up. But the practice was winding down, so to, to the partners retiring. So I, I I was their junior, junior receptionist, typist, filing clerk, dog's body. And over the year that I worked there, it got the work got less and less and less and less. And we were just around the corner from Bath Public Library, because I grew up in Bath. Um, and so I went down to the library and I began to read in my lunch hour originally. And then it 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 took over the entire day because there was nothing to do except answer the phone. And then I couldn't remember who was in and who was out. So I just then went back to my book. And I, I read a lot of novels, but I also read a lot of um a lot of nonfiction. And I was always the kind of person who was interested in I was always interested in facts, the kind of facts about why do we live in the way we do. So I found a shelf that was full of things like the history of the umbrella and um and roads through the ages and that kind of thing. And a load of shelves of um, there were uh, biographies of kings and queens. There's a whole shelf of biographies of kings and queens. And then the next, I read through the whole thing, including all of George the Third's fifteen children. You know, I was a real expert in minor German princesses. And I got to the end of the um of the shelf, and on the shelf below was archaeology. And I 
I realized that this was something that you could do. It was fun and you got paid for it. So I would get paid like I was as a typist, but I would enjoy myself. So um, I, I asked around my friends if anybody knew anybody who was an archaeologist. And one person was discovered who I think is now something like Professor of Historical Geography at Exeter or something. He's called Tim Quine. And I wrote him a letter and I said, how do you become an archaeologist? And he wrote back and he said, um, all you have to do is get the CBA newsletter. That's the starting point and you'll be fine. And so I got the CBA newsletter and I, I found out, which is now British Archaeology, and I found out how the world of archaeology works. And eventually I realised I had to apply to university and for that I would need a job. And so I got onto the Manpower Services Commission, which incidentally, um, you had to be unemployed for six months to do that. So I had another little holiday at the taxpayer's expense <laughs> uh, and then got on to, to, the, to the community programme run by the Manpower Services Commission. Um, and, uh, and that was enough to get me into university, even with my terrible, terrible A-levels. And once I got into university, I just, it was the thing that I, I just found my tribe, you know, it was just amazing. Um, and, and I've, uh, after that, all I have ever done is just say yes to things. Um, and, and sometimes someone has, I've had a slight kind of a nudge in the right direction from somebody. Um, but really it's, it's just been, surrounding yourself with the kind of people who are doing fun stuff and if someone says do you want to join in saying yes so so it has all been luck well okay you've fallen into our trap there helen because we'll always say you make your own luck and in this oh, instance now saying yes to things is you, making your own luck you've fallen into my trap because oh, no. i've heard gus's podcast, a trap. <laughs> which was fantastic but i'm afraid i got a bit I, I, I stamped my foot at the point where you said you make your own luck because you do know, don't you? That's an incredibly political thing to say. Now, if you look at somebody like Jack Munro, single parent, very little money, she if if she made her own luck by become by being able to earn a living blogging and writing recipe uh, books and so on, if if you say, well, you make your own luck, then anybody in Jack Munro's situation could be expected to make their own luck. She's done it. Why can't you? You're just feckless. You get up and and don't expect the state to give you a helping hand. Now, I I because of my experience, my experience is that if the state gives you a little bit of investment at the right time, if they give you a YTS course, if they give you a community program, eventually, even somebody like me will turn into a useful member of society. <laughs> and you 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 make your own. You think you make your own luck. I'm afraid if you're white middle class and often male and you don't realize quite how much privilege you've got so I don't think I did make my own luck all I did was I was I was lucky enough to remember to be open-minded at the right times so one of the one of the great pieces of one of my great kind of sliding doors changing a, a, a dangerous corner if you like at university was when my tutor um, the, the much missed Martin Welsh said he looked down at my exam results at the end of second year and he said well you won't get a first but of course there's no reason why you shouldn't get a reasonably decent 2-1 and I thought how dare you how dare you say that I'm going to get a first just to show you and I've never known I, I never managed to ask him before he died whether it was a very clever piece of manipulation or whether he was just being a bit rude um you know did he mean it or not I don't think he possibly could have could have um realized how that that's the perfect thing because I'm a contrarian if you tell me I can't do something I just say well, of course I can whereas if you say oh you're good at that you'll be able to do it I say oh, I don't think I can actually Yes, fair enough. You've absolutely schooled me there. And I'll, I'll accept everything that you said in that sense. It's not meant to overshadow or overlook everything you said. Everything you said is absolutely right. But there's also an element, I think, of where, where, where we're coming from this is that if you can be contrary, if you can say yes to opportunities, and if, if you can take opportunities when they're presented to you, that that in my vocabulary would be making your own luck. But yeah, I also I accept everything you're saying there. To be honest, it's a mixture of both, isn't it? If you don't mm -hmm. get any luck, 
you can't capitalize on it. Mm. You've got to be able to spot luck. So, so of mm. course, it's one of these things that's not black or white. No. And, no. and I'll give you another example of my contrarianism, um, because, of course, I grew up in Bath, a place where you do the Romans from primary school endlessly over and over again. Every single one of your school trips is to somewhere local, which is the Romans. Um, and we were, in essence, given the idea that everybody knows about the Romans. So that's easy, isn't it? Why would you ever want to find out any more? There is no mystery. There is nothing that, that your teacher doesn't already know. Of course, in later years, I found out how untrue that was. But at 18, 19, the last thing I ever wanted to study was the Romans. So I was when, when, once I realised that archaeology was, was something that you could do, you didn't have to have passed your history O-level. Um, all you needed was to be reasonably strong and sensible and, and to be able to spot things. Um, so I, I, I felt then and I still feel now that it's one of the most inclusive professions that, that you can possibly choose. It, there's a place for, it's like an old fashioned rugby team. Um, that's another Bath thing, you know, an old fashioned rugby team, there's a place for everybody, no matter what your size, shape or ability, apparently, uh, in a village rugby team, you can play. Uh, so archaeology is like that. But um, but I, I definitely didn't want to look at the Romans. And I thought, well, I want to know why why we live the way we do. And the great mystery is what happens after the Romans, because in Bath, you had the longest Dark Ages of anywhere. The Dark Ages lasts in Bath from the end or did in my teenage years, from the end of the Roman period up to 1720, when John Wood built Queen Square. And we emerge into Georgian Bath blinking in the sunlight but what has happened between those two it seemed when I was at school that it was just impossible to say so I got really into Anglo-Saxons and the medieval period um, not the Vikings because they weren't around me so you're so shaped by by where you grow up uh, where you grow up and by the people around you and and for me I only want a mystery I don't want to study what other people are, are seem to already know I want to find out what isn't known. So, so I found this amazing um, archaeology course called Medieval Archaeology. And as you can imagine, it wasn't terribly oversubscribed. There are not many people who wanted to do a whole um, bachelor's degree, first degree in medieval archaeology. And there were actually only eight of us in, in my year. And there were four members of staff. I mean, the staff-student ratio was to die for. Um, so, so that's where I, I ended up going to university after a catastrophic interview because I had no you know my school wasn't interested in helping me do interviews because I'd said I didn't want to go to university so I turned up at this interview wearing a skirt which is unusual for me I felt a bit nervous uh, and they said so what books have you been reading and I thought well I've been reading them but I haven't been looking at what they're called so I said well one's a purple book with a picture of you know and I described them picture of the author on the back and they turned to each other and nodded and said yes that's Philip Barker you know it went on like that. And I staggered out thinking there's no way they're ever going to have me. But but after having applied to, I think that was the 15th university I'd applied to, they finally, somebody let me in at UCL. So again, I was lucky that they took a punt on me. So then, of course, after, at the end of my first year, we had visiting lecturers come. And um, at the end of my first year, we got a, a visit from a um from an intriguing and unusual man called Martin Carver, who was digging at Sutton Hoo. And we were all completely starstruck by the idea of Sutton Hoo. Um, I think it was already on the television at that point. So out of my year of eight, four of us applied to go to Sutton Hoo in the summer. Um, and, and Martin was terribly inviting, you know, a bit like um, a bit like uh, Professor Quine. He, um, he, he just said, Write, write to this address, you know, before the, the internet, he gives out this address, write to, write to this address and, and you can definitely come um, and, and work at Sutton Hoo. And we thought, we, we thought we'd hit the jackpot, you know, a, a site that everybody had heard about all around the world. Um, and I, I, I signed up um, for five weeks um, and I had to go to, I had to go to a ball the week after that's why I signed up for five weeks I had to go to a friend's coming 
kind of Sandhurst coming out ball, whatever that it's called. It's it's something like is it passing? Passing out, passing out. Yeah. So that was kind of like the that that week marked the end of my I want to have a good time all the time. Um cocktails and balls and ball dresses and Sloan Ranger hood and the start of my um my archaeological life because I came home, lay out in the sun for most of that week, trying to even out the tan lines of the vests and the t-shirts and things because I was so sunburned. Um put on my ball dress, went off to the ball, came back and went straight back to Sutton Hoo because I couldn't stay away. Um, so Sutton Hoo was another another um fantastic thing and that led to my PhD because when I did surprise when Martin Welsh gave me that that prod and said you're not going to get a first so I therefore showed him that I could um I got a first and I went back to Sutton Hoo immediately uh for the summer's season and um, and Martin said how did you do what did you get and I said I got a first he said well you can get a grant for a PhD then come and do a PhD with me and I thought Oh well, I suppose I have got no other idea what I'm going to do. So, so we talked all that summer about about doing a PhD, um, and it came down because Sutton Hoo see is so extraordinary. Um, I I said, well, what are the what are the other cemeteries like? And everybody tended to say, well, there aren't any others. So we came down on this this subject of the other cemeteries um and we had a few visitors towards the end of the summer and I said oh, I'm going to apply to do a PhD and they said what's what's it going to be on and I said the, the the cemeteries cemeteries at the time of Sutton Hoo I remember one person going oh yeah short thesis <laughs> and I thought I'd I'd it would be I thought it would be a challenge you know people said you can't do that it's not possible we don't know um so I, I got a grant and I went to York and I did a PhD um, where it turned out to be that they were all sitting there. We just, nobody had looked at them and collected them up, these cemeteries. And that's where I got into, when I began to get into politics, really, because my I, I gathered up, I made a huge heap of all these um, cemeteries, all these graves. They were mainly dated by women's costume because they, because the women, the Anglo-Saxons all the way through the the fifth, sixth, and seventh centuries are buried in their clothes with their jewelry. Um, at that time, we didn't really know, and we still don't, in fact, to be fair, whether they're buried in everyday dress or something or their Sunday best, if you like. Um, but they were clearly buried in very standardized ways that probably encoded something about them. Um, now, the obvious things that we could tell from the bones is how old they were and what sex they were. Um, but there, there were probably other things like what were they good at doing, what identity they had in their in their um, community. Um, were they the person that everybody goes to for healing? Were they um, somebody who um, had an awful lot of children? Were they somebody who could tell what the weather was going to be like? You know, the, 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 the status you hold in your in your community seemed to have been encoded in their graves, which was encoded, which for which you read costume, you know, because that's what you're wearing. So I became really interested in the politics of costume because I was dealing with the top echelons of society and um, it was really different what was happening in the seventh century from what was happening in the sixth. Now, this is kind of familiar in burial customs because if you go back to late Roman burial customs, what how people are burying are being buried in the fourth century is very, very different to how people are being buried in the fifth century. And the explanation that we use for that is that um, Roman society had collapsed and Anglo-Saxons all piled into boats and came over with new burial practices. So, so at that point, people were tending to use migration as an explanation. But you couldn't do that in the seventh century because there is no historical record of anybody piling into a boat and coming on over. There's no language change. Um, what there is instead is this political change. So again, I was being a bit of a contrarian and looking at um, the looking at the ideas that that were accepted and saying, well, actually, that doesn't need to be the case. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's something completely different. And 
I don't always turn out to be right. That's the thing. If you're a contrarian, you often don't turn out to be right. But you do, you do, you're like the grit in the oyster a bit, aren't you? You push other people to be, to say what they mean and to think more clearly. If you say, hang on, that doesn't really work. Um, hopefully, anyway. Oh, all I've ever wanted to really be is of use to people. So I like to type because I like to be of use. I like to dig holes because that seemed to be wanted as well. And I could do it quite quickly. I was quite big and strong. And then I wanted to find out about cemeteries and burial practices because that seemed to be an area that we didn't know much about and and now um my job is also providing records of finds for people who can use them so that's that's what i've ended up doing so i should tell you how i got to do that shouldn't i absolutely <laughs> i feel like i'm i'm constantly talking and not letting any this uh, is this is brilliant yeah, so that, that's this is the portable antiquity scheme is it well, I'm not going to go on immediately to that, am I? What then happened? Well, so I finished my PhD and luckily it was in the days just before the internet and just before um, uh, the enormous explosion of grey literature. So I, I managed to do it um, reasonably easily, still having a lot of fun. Um, and uh, and then, oh, I didn't have anything else to do. It was like finishing my first degree. What am I going to do now? So I... I've got a bit of money to to um, to do a bit of a, a, a little project or two. Um, and then the phone went one day um, and it was somebody who I'd never heard of at Norwich Castle Museum saying, do you want a job? And this was 1996 and it, the world was a very different place then. And what had happened was that at Norwich Castle Museum, somebody had suddenly got ill. Um, and Norwich um, and Norfolk liaised, they were the only, the, the first county really to be liaising with metal detectorists, going to clubs, borrowing their objects, um, recording them on uh, backs of envelopes, copying it onto the HER and giving the objects back. And they had this treadmill, you know, every month they went to four or five clubs identified all of the finds and took them back. And somebody becoming ill was absolutely catastrophic. They couldn't, they, 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 the, the picture they gave of me is that all this stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, all this stuff was going to be mounting up and up and up and up around their desks, you know, and they couldn't possibly have somebody off for a few weeks without having them replaced. And I said, well, why me? And he said, well, I phoned my friend Pete up and asked him if he wanted to do it. And he said, no, he didn't have time. But he said, but my friend Helen, she needs a job. Bring her up. So that's how I got rung up. Um, and I thought, well, I haven't got anything else to do. Might be might be fun. Uh, so I went down to Norwich for, I think it was four months in the first instance, to work with metal detectorists. And that was literally, you took the object out of the bag <clears throat> You took the object out of the bag. You got yourself a little coin envelope, which is something about the size of the smallest finds bag. It's about an inch and a half square. And you wrote what it was on the bag for the finder, popped on the envelope, popped the thing in the envelope um, and gave it back. But before you gave it back, you took everything out of the envelopes and popped them on the photocopier and took a photocopy and then sent that off to the HER, to the Historic Environment Record. So it was the lowest tech thing you can possibly imagine. I began my career writing in pencil on brown paper envelopes, which something, you know, I feel like I'm, uh, you tell that to the young people these days and they won't believe you. So that's how I got involved with objects. And then I noticed that there was, there were people kept having meetings about something called the Portable Antiquities Scheme which is just about to start. And that's where I think my luck has been the most amazing thing, because I was at the beginning of the Portable Antiquities Scheme. I wasn't working for it. I was working for Norwich Castle Museum, but I could help to shape it. I could use my experience, such as it was, to say, why don't we do it like this? And why don't we do it like that? Um, and so I fell into this job at Norwich. But in, in the end, they offered me a, a, a permanent job. Um, 
And I got seconded by the Portable Antiquities Scheme in 2000 to write their finds recording guide, which um, which was a way, uh, the instructions, if you like, to 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 work as a as a Portable Antiquities Scheme officer. And then very soon after that, I joined the scheme because I I, I wanted to um, I wanted to move house so I could live with the man who became my husband, which is a very romantic reason to leave a job. Um, and uh, and and I've been working for the for the scheme ever since. So that so that's really apart from time team, I have now given you virtually my full CV. Well, we'll we'll get to time team in a minute, I think. But um, it's so nice to hear about your incredible career. And I I, I must admit, I'm very introspective at the moment about uh, the the uh, the positions we take on this podcast, um, particularly in and around luck. Um, I will I will admit though that we I think we both started coining the phrase and using the phrase mostly because a lot of our guests particularly early on were being overly humble about things they'd done and effort they'd put in so um I I I don't think we're I I I am going to look at look at ourselves and look at our privilege and think about our privilege but when you were talking at first and throughout I I I heard you you wrote the letter you wrote the letter to that lecturer who's now at Exeter is it is it is it Tim Quine am I remembering properly yes it is yeah yeah he, he's it's um Professor Tim Quine Deputy Vice Chancellor at Exeter wow. University I just want to say that it's amazing that that I, I got his name right because um he he his dad taught my brother at junior school and so it was it was all the people around our village and so on who knew who knew the crimes and he was the only person that was that was an archaeologist and so it was like the the one person who can help you did actually write back which was wonderful oh and it, it in a way the um the fact he was in your world and orbit view that's a bit out of your control that's the luck bit that's the fortune bit but you wrote the letter you did the reading you you were contrary enough to get the first in the face of uh, um the challenge from from your supervisor and when the opportunities presented themselves you'd put in the work and and so much of that is your own agency as well yeah, as but can I can I just stop you there as well I'm I'm a terrible one for interrupting I don't know I don't know I've got awful social skills um but it's it's not hard work is not hard work when you want to do it you know you see a a a, a small child practicing football and you think gosh they're working really hard well you don't actually you think they're playing they they could be practicing football or if they like it practicing the piano for six hours a day and it's not work and it's not practice it's just playing and I think there's quite a lot of um there's quite a lot of work that that is just work but there's quite a lot of work that's just fun and today this just this morning I was I was thinking oh I've, I've, I've had enough of filing um acknowledgements from coroners about treasure cases I just want to stop and have some lunch. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just open, I'll just sort out this next case. And I opened the bag and there was this unbelievable Bronze Age penannula ring made out of striped gold and electrum. And I, it's not often now, because I'm so old and jaded, that, that I hold something in my hand and just think, this is incredible. And I, of course, I couldn't leave it. I, uh, suddenly all the this is work dropped away and I thought this is so beautiful I want to measure it I want to understand it I want to look at every little bit of it I want to to, to look at the seams between the gold and the electrum how did they do it did the numbers matter you know and all this I never do anything with any of this I'm never going to write an article about Bronze Age penannular rings but I can get it onto a database and and it's there for somebody else and I have touched that and looked at it and cared for it in a way brought it back to life and and so doing that it's it's not it's not work really it's it's what I like doing and thankfully someone will pay me for it that's that's absolutely fair enough and I suppose the ultimate stroke of luck for all three of us is there's this wonderful quirky bizarre profession that pays us to do things that we love and that that is I, I'll I'll take that that is the ultimate luck <laughs> because I don't know what the hell else I'd do if it wasn't for this this mad world of archaeology heritage that we we all occupy <laughs> Yeah, as my mother once said, I'm so glad you found a niche. <laughs> we definitely have. 
And and speaking of niches and speaking of luck, you mentioned time team just now, and it would be remiss of us, I think, if we didn't try and try and find out how you got from being where you were working with small fines, working working in in Norwich to being time teams Helen Geek. Well, yeah, that all started off um, because I was a bit bored uh, in some ways at at work. Um, for all the Bronze Age Penanula rings you get, you get a lot of 17th century buckles. Um, and, and maybe we don't record all of them anymore, but um, we were recording a lot of those. And it's really hard to see how the more kind of everyday stuff adds up. You know, I know it's important. Um, and I know that archaeology is the only way of seeing people who don't make their mark on history. But doing it all the time is quite dull so I was a bit bored and um and it was late in the afternoon at, at work in in Suffolk where I live now um, and I thought oh, well just before I go home I'll just have a quick look on the British Archaeology message board um which uh was something that you know early internet we used to look at something and there were lots of posts of some kind I can't really remember how it worked uh but there was something from well, a name I recognized which was Jenny Butterworth so I recognised her off the credits of Time Team. And she said in her post, do you think that you, um, do you think you're good at explaining things to people? And I thought, well, yeah, I do. I do think I'm good at that. Um, uh, have you got a good general knowledge of archaeology? Would you like to be involved with a, a television programme? And I thought, well, yes, to all of those. But the thing that I was more um, focused on at that point was I was really interested in writing. And I thought, I don't know if I want to work on a television programme, but I bet I could write a really good application that will get me that I, I bet I can do this with 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 a with a fantastic answer. I, I've actually still got the advertisement, but I haven't got my answer, which is probably quite good considering how pleased I was with it. Um so I sent this off to Jenny and um and she emailed back and said, come for a screen test. I thought, oh, that sounds so glamorous, so glamorous. Um, so I went to Ware in Hertfordshire and met a couple of people, not including Jenny, who um, asked me to walk up and down um, the side of a wood and talk about earthworks. And I thought, well, that's just what I do every weekend. Um, so so I did this, wandered up and down talking about earthworks. Uh, and, and that was it. And then um, I went home and they uh rang me up and said you've got the job we're going to make a a, a a a kind of son of time team because it turned out to be the company behind um time team um video text and picture house it was them trying channel four had said time team is getting to be a massive beer moth it is absolutely huge now it's not um three people and a dog uh, it's not let, let's do the show right here. You know, it's it's no longer something that people could do themselves. Um, and there needs to be a, a kind of time team light. Uh, only, unfortunately, it turned out that the world didn't need a time team light and that you couldn't really make it different enough from time team, which the, the great strength of time team has always been that it just covers everything. It does everything. Um, so all the competitors have always been, let's go up in a helicopter like Time Team does some of the time, or let's look at cemeteries like Time Team does some of the time. They've never really lasted in the way that Time Team has. And the, the reason for that is it's rather like the Portable Antiquities Scheme. It got in at the beginning. You know, the the the, the trick of, of having a good and interesting career is finding something at the start. Um, and so, so that's how people like... Um, like Carenza and Phil and Nick and Victor, how they ended up with such a fantastic program. Um, and and that's how I've enjoyed all these years on the Portable Antiquity Scheme. Anyway, I didn't manage to do it for Time Team because I, I then found that, that this program that we made two pilots of wasn't going to go anywhere. But because I had... Um, chatted, I suppose, a lot about the Anglo-Saxons while I was doing it, I, they they noticed that here I was a, a a person who could come along and talk about the Anglo-Saxons. Um, so they invited me on um, the live at Bremer, which was 
A, Portable Antiquities Scheme generated site, and B, an Anglo-Saxon site. And I had an almighty row with Robin Bush, who um, I didn't agree with at all, anything he said. Um, and because I have no social skills, I didn't know how to do this politely. So I just said, well, that's all absolutely rubbish. <laughs> um, that, that didn't happen. Um, and uh, and it didn't, he took it very well, you know, and instead of being hounded out of the place of being rude to people, um, they seem to like my brand of, um, of, of of tactlessness and and so i i got asked back um and and in the words of another rival podcast the rest is history <laughs> better podcast some might say <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> thank you helen for that journey and and thank goodness you were you were so abrupt with with robin because uh you you've become a a steadfast fantastic addition to um the 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 original gang is it the original group the, the time team originals um to and and it's fantastic you're still involved with with the uh with the relaunch to, um, which is going out today as well um so moving on ever so slightly um we have three standard questions that we like to ask in the podcast and the first one of those of of, of that very interesting and rich career and ruins that you've had to date is there a piece of work that you you've done or you've been involved with that you're particularly proud of well I suppose I am most proud of, of having been in at the start of the Portable Antiquities Scheme and having been able to shape it because it, it seems now like it, it's it's a bit like Time Team, you know, it's just grown and grown and it is now a huge thing that people um, think, well, it kind of runs itself almost, you know, how, how could we live without it? Um, but when we began, it's really difficult to remember how incredibly new this was People said it, it will be meaningless. Nothing from the topsoil means anything. We scrape it off, we throw it away. Um, and, and we were expecting finds made by members of the public, metal detectorists and gardeners and walkers and anybody finding things by accident was going to bring them to us and it was going to be in some way meaningful. Um, the only way you can make something like that meaningful is if it's retrievable. It's a kind of big data exercise. So the first few years, the data was not useful. And we were just really lucky that the government continued to fund us um, until until we got to a point where the, we had enough data to do something with. But so then we got a database, an access database, but nobody knew how to knew what to say. There were no uh, accepted terms because archaeological finds had always been put in an archive for you to have to go back to every time you changed your questions, you could go back to the museum store and ask new questions of the old objects. But we were borrowing these and giving them back. And um, one of um, one of the first things I had to deal with in Norwich was that um, John Hines from Cardiff, the rune expert, um, probably wrote me a letter in those days or phoned up and he said, um, I've seen this picture of an object that you've got, but you haven't got a picture of the reverse and I don't know what it is. Can you get it back off the, the chap who found it and take a photo of the reverse? So I went round to his house uh, and he wasn't there. And his mum said he hasn't lived here for a while. I don't know what's happened to any of his finds. So it made you realise that you, it, it was like any archaeology. You've got to uh, replace it with a record. It's not, um, it's not traditional finds work. So we had to standardise everything we were doing, make, make everything... Um, consistent and understandable um, and then we had to to um, well I remember ringing my brother up who who because of our surname one of us has to work in IT so my brother has drawn the short straw and he works in IT and he said you are going to have to put this database on the internet and I said can we do that he said yes insurance companies do it if you ring up and get an insurance quote you'll hear them tapping away. They've got a database on their, on the internet. So I rang up my boss and I said, I, I think we're going to have to put it on the internet. And he said, I don't think that will ever be possible. <laughs> so that just underlines how, how new and different it was. And to have been able to, to make really big 
decisions about what we call things and to shape the way that it is. I, I mean, I might have been wrong a lot of the time, but I, I, I've written most of the guidance for how we record things on the on the portable antiquities scheme, and and that to me feels like. Uh, the kind of achievement that is going to is going nobody nobody knows I've done it you know it, it doesn't have my name on it but that's the kind of thing that's going to live on after me I've been able to to set it up it's a bit like the people who call um, why do we call um, things like round barrows round barrows somebody had to think up that word and, and I've I've thought up quite a lot of words for things. Um, and, and, and that just feels like such an incredible privilege to have been part of something really new. That's a, that's a very, very, very good answer. And I, I when, when you mentioned that uh, um, at the beginning, you thought, oh, this will never be of any use. This will, um, what, what will this ever be for? I, I started to think about a podcast we had a little while ago, um, all about the Portable Antiquity Scheme. And we we chatted to, I think it was Michael Lewis and um, a detectorist who does self-recording, uh, Emma Ewell. And what struck me was that the Portable Antiquity Scheme itself had such an influence on not only how she detects but how she learns how she engages with the past how she engages with archaeology and it's that that relationship that flow of information from her to the PAS and back again that inspired her to get more and more into learning about history and archaeology in the past so it's it's got these incredible knock-on effects which go far beyond being an online database or a, a research tool or a a record it's it's it feels like it's always been around now, which I think is a great mark of success that you, you can't remember a world without the PAS. No, uh, but, but has it ever occurred to you? Now, uh, you, know, you, must, you are going to have to stop me at some time, otherwise I'm going to be still talking at midnight. But has it ever occurred to you that what we're looking at on the Portable Antiquities Scheme is a, an entirely different class of object in that... On a, on a normal archaeological site, you're dealing with deposits that, that, that are built up where somebody's living, uh, like rubbish mainly, and um, or, or if you excavate a cemetery, that's an intentional deposit. But you never find anything that hasn't either been deliberately put into the earth or has been deliberately thrown away. Um, and that's because we dig these tiny holes in places where we know there will be a lot of archaeology to look at. We don't strip vast areas of the countryside because there would be nothing there. But metal detectorists search the topsoil with an object that with a machine which um, helps them do vast swathes and find the tiny little nuggets of information that are in, in that's in the topsoil. And what they're finding is objects that have been lost. And so we've had this huge explosion in things like seal matrices. Uh, there were hardly any uh, of these little objects that make um, make a seal on a document like a modern signature to to authenticate it to say yes I I this is my document and here I fix my seal we had hardly any of them and they were thought to be confined to the upper classes you know the literate classes um they're now there's something like the seventh most common medieval object we've got on the portable antiquity scheme because they're made of metal and we can find them and they were never thrown away um they were I don't think ever intentionally buried in a hoard or something. They were always only lost. The ones we're finding are losses, and they're adding an entirely different uh, um, set of data. So we've got this bias towards lost objects in the way that the rest of archaeology has got a bias towards rubbish, um, and cemetery archaeology has got a, a, a bias towards people who 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 bury. Um, without without cremating or explanation or, or whatever. Uh, it, it just adds a, a new and different bias. And the other thing it does that nothing else does is, is um, no, that's completely wrong. I was going to say nothing else does. And then I suddenly thought, aerial photographs, field <laughs> it, It's quite a good way, not the best, not the only, quite a good way at looking at plough damage. And I think mm. it, it's also um, alerted us to that, which is a whole nother podcast <laughs> If you ever thought you might like to do one on that, I would be delighted to come along and mouth off about um, 
about a thousand. Let's get it in the diary. Let's get it in the diary. But for now, we need to at least get slightly back on track. We, we've got pride, and I think that's a fantastic pride. But what about envy, Helen? Who, whose work have you seen that you thought that is blooming fantastic? I wish I'd, I'd been involved in that. Ooh. Well, gosh, that's that's the person who's just popped into my head is I would have liked to have had Jackie McKinley's career, actually, um, because I wrote to her when I was an undergraduate doing my my undergraduate dissertation was on um, the kinds of miniature toilet implements, um, razors, shears and tweezers that you find in cremation burials. And I wanted to, to link them with age and sex and um, because they're in cremation burials, there was only one person to to ask about that, and it was Jackie. And she had all the unpublished data from Spong Hill, which she gave me um, incredibly generously. Um, so that was where I first encountered her. And until Jackie came along, people mainly threw cremated bones away um, because there was no way of finding out pathology or... Or, or, or almost no way of finding out age and sex. You know, it's really rudimentary. And that's the big gap in what I do. I don't, I'm no good at skeletons um, because I've worked on plow smash sites and I've worked on cremated sites and, and I, I've rarely excavated intact, deep, proper skeletons. And I've never been asked to um, to, to study them. So, uh, but I'm I'm so interested in them because they they're the individuals that populate all of my theoretical ideas about um, about who's wearing what and why they're wearing it. The, the the actual people, and we we so rarely get to to be with the actual people who have made our objects or lived in our places. Um, and and Jackie not only has has set up this amazing research field of of cremated bone but she also gets to work with individuals and to be able to see their their bones um every day and she's also got this really bad habit of staring at people on trains that i have and margaret cox has and lots of people who are interested in skulls have you, you find yourself <laughs> looking at somebody um you usually i'm afraid a man and thinking oh you haven't got very big brow ridges yet how old are you <laughs> I must admit, I, uh, I work with a fair number of uh, people with human bone fascinations and said that there's, there's never a, an x-ray in the building that doesn't get nicked or hoovered up to think, oh, what does that break look like? Oh, what does that bone look like? Um, I've, I've lost, a, lost a few to some colleagues that, <laughs> that way. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I love Jackie and I was, I was fortunate enough for a few years to work with Jackie at Wessex and she's she's both a wonderful person and an inspirational person so a, a very very good career to be envious of um and one last question before we we let you go helen um lawrence and i um have built a functional time machine um that can take you anywhere in the past anywhere in the world it has very flexible rules around um geography um time and various other rules we can bend visibility uh, visibility <laughs> if necessary um but if you had a return ticket to anywhere in the past where would you go helen how long am i allowed to borrow it for oh if i can have it for one day only if i have really? to return it by midnight kind of thing oh. otherwise it turns into a pumpkin i will choose to go to a Roman town, which is probably going to be very Lamian because I know there was something interesting going on there. I would like to go back to, I think it's 429, something like that, when St Germanus comes to visit Verulamium. But I would only like to stay for lunch and I would like to meet St Germanus, who has come from the Roman Empire. Um, I'd like to know what he thinks about Verulamium and I'd like to know what the Verulamians think about the new people coming over speaking German. And whether there are very many of them in Verulamium. But I don't want it for very long because I think Verulamium in 429 is going to be like here without the internet. Everything is breaking down. There's Without the internet and without petrol. Can you imagine? Um, food supplies, labour supplies. Um, there's You can't get the slaves. You can't get the fuel. Your house is cold. The running water's failing. Um, 
just nothing is working with potholes in the roads. No one's paying their tax. Why should they? Because they're not getting anything back. Um, it, it It's horrible. I only want to stay for lunch. I'll be back. But then if I could have it for a few years, I would prefer to go to York because it's it's where I did my PhD and I know it really, really well. So I've got an idea of the geography and I would like to go in 624 and not come back for three or four years because I think that then I would get to know a lot. I would be able to um, hopefully talk to King Edwin uh, about his conversion to Christianity and I would see the Minster being built. Um, and also, I think King Edwin is the kind of calibre of person who would have been invited to King Redwald's funeral. So I could maybe have a trip down to East Anglia to see the funeral that ended up as Sutton Hill um, one. And then I would come back and I'd be able to write the most amazing articles and no one would know how I knew. <laughs> There's so many good things there. And I think the way that the time machine works is that as long as it's back by midnight, you can spend as long as you, you're there. And it doesn't, I mean, all you have to turn the dial to is midnight that, that, that same on. day. So, Are you saying it's not Bill and Ted rules? <laughs> <laughs> you, of course, you just set the dial to a minute after you left and you don't know how long I've been there for. I don't know how to drive a time machine, you know. It's really simple. It's, I mean, Derek and I made it, so it's idiot proof, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but Helen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time this evening and for sharing your career in ruins with us. And um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to learn a bit more about our colleague and and hopefully share that with um, with with our audience and and a, and a wider wider group of people as well. So thank you ever so much. It's been a great pleasure because we, 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 we're we usually in such a big um, chaotic scrum on time teams. Um, and it's been really nice just to to, to have a, a, a chat with two of you just on your own. It's been an absolute treat. And I, I, I must admit, the uh, uh, in all of the uh, career rooms we've done with various time team folks, I've learned so much from everyone and it's been an absolute joy. And tonight has been absolutely no different. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to give a, a quick thanks to our, our small but loyal team of Patreons who keep the uh, the bill collectors at bay and allow us to keep the podcast live and online. Thank you for your continued support and uh, do keep sending us your messages and comments on Patreon. Um, we'll endeavour to respond to everyone as soon as we can. And thank you everyone for listening.